Welcome to the Back on Track podcast with me, Sam West. My mission is to inspire, helping you to get through the tough times and live a better, more fulfilling life. On the show, I speak to inspirational people that have come back from rock bottom and also experts that provide you with the tools you need to implement positive changes in your life. Above all, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to hit subscribe. And here's a little clip of what's coming up next. Think back to this experience. You start having symptoms and your mind goes into a big where, oh my God, I'm going to have a panic attack. This is going to be terrible. So it's almost like you can cognitively trigger a fight flight response because of your, what we call a catastrophic misinterpretation. But basically when you have, you know, scary thoughts about your symptoms, it can trigger a fight flight response. So one of the ways to not create that is to say like, bring it on. And I want to add just to that little mantra is like, is acknowledging it's uncomfortable. Like I don't want people to invalidate their experience. Right. But to be able to say this is uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous because that's where that fear comes from is really feeling like these symptoms are somehow dangerous. And if you can say like, this sucks, it's uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. It's temporary. I can handle it. You know, that can go a long way. And, and, Part of the way to believe that it's not dangerous, because you might say that and really be like, but no, my body is in fight flight mode, which is my body's way of saying I'm in danger. It's basically responding to a false alarm. But every single symptom of a panic attack exists to help you survive. Jill, first of all, I just want to say a massive thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And how are you doing? How's everything going? Well, it's my pleasure, Sam. Thank you for inviting me. I have to say we connected on Twitter and I have one of those like love hate relationships with social media. And so when I can make connections with other people who share similar interests, it's, you know, the the love for Twitter comes back. So I, I'm glad that we were able to connect that way. Yeah, exactly. There are sometimes some yeah. positive uses for social media, although right. they might right. they might be quite limited. And um, yeah. Jill, obviously, the purpose of this episode was to focus on uh, anxiety and give listeners sort of an idea of um, what's actually going on when we feel that, and some sort of tips on on how to combat it. But <clears throat> before we get into that, I was actually quite keen to hear about sort of how you became a psychologist because. I was reading on on your website um, and it seemed there was almost quite an interesting story there. I think that you had a little bit of a difficult time growing up in in some ways with with people calling you names or something it, it said on there. And I'm wondering if if that led to sort of some of your own difficulties that you wanted to understand later on in life by going into psychology yourself. Is that kind of how it started or, or are the two things kind I of think, totally unrelated? I mean, I think that is very likely, but it's not something that I was conscious consciously aware of at the time. So what you're talking about, you know, the story that I talk about on my website is um, growing up, my, it was my parents actually, who otherwise were very lovely parents and people. They were by, <laughs> by no means mean or abusive, but they would call me tubby, little tubette, tubby, tubby, two by four. And, and I think their intention was to try to prevent me from getting very overweight and unhealthy Um, But, you know, needless to say, it didn't work and it led to some (laughs) pretty uncomfortable thoughts and feelings about myself and my my self-worth. So I I think it would be impossible that those things weren't related, you know, that 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 history wasn't related to my interest in psychology. Um, But I took a psychology class in high school. They they had a couple electives. You know, I took accounting. I took pre-law. And I took psychology and I loved both my law and my psychology class were like, this is it. Right. And I, the love of psychology was really at that time, more about loving, understanding what makes people tick, Yeah, you know, to kind of put it sort of broadly and simply. Mm-hmm. Um, but I imagine there was probably a desire to understand what made me tick too, mm-hmm. even if that wasn't the conscious reason to pursue it at the time. And I figured, well, it's either going to be law school or psychology. And then I interned at a kind of a boys club law firm one summer, 
And let's just say the psychology deal was sealed from yeah. that point forward. <laughs> yeah, you, you were sold. Yeah, I can imagine. And I, I, I assume this is sort of a similar story for a lot of um, psycho- psychologists and therapists that a byproduct of training in it is you actually learn to understand yourself in so much more detail. And and I imagine that's um, that's a real benefit. But obviously, since then, you've gone, gone on to achieve so much. You started uh, your own Center for Stress and Anxiety Management. You've written a couple of books also on, on mental health, which we'll of course link in, in the description. Um, so yeah, you've achieved a, a hell of a lot. You also have your own podcast, I think as well, which, uh, which again, I'll be sure to, I'll be sure to link in the description. So we'd need a podcast, you know, on its own to go through all of that. But as you know, today we're here to focus on, focus on anxiety in particular. And I suppose the best way to, to start is by sort of asking if you could explain, first of all, sort of what some of the common symptoms are and also what is actually going on in our bodies and minds sort of physiologically when we feel anxious, when we become anxious, because I think it can often feel anxiety for people that suffer with it, myself included, like this super abstract thing, this sort of external force. And and I know th- through having gone through my own therapy that it, it helped quite a lot to sort of understand what's actually going on in my body and mind when it's happening. So so yeah, two parts, I guess, um, sort of the general symptoms and and what is our body doing when we when we feel anxious. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And of course, you know, the answer to those seemingly two separate questions is quite intertwined. And the way I normally like to answer this question is to differentiate between fear and anxiety, because we often use those two terms um, interchangeably. Sure. And certainly there's overlap, but they really are two distinct emotional experiences. And so fear is that like acute in the moment, there is some perceived danger and our body reacts Um, our sympathetic nervous. So I'm going to answer both your questions sort of together. So sympathetic nervous system Mm. kicks in and basically sets off your fight flight response. So racing heart, shortness of breath, numbness, tingling, you know, any of those kinds of different, like that sort of adrenaline feeling, right? So that's fear. That's like somebody has come in the room with a gun and you're experiencing fear. Anxiety is more of a state of readiness for danger. So fear is I am in danger. Right. Anxiety is I am in a state of readiness that there is a potential danger up ahead or around the corner. And those physical symptoms are less of that like fight flight, um, you know, where you have a you have a peak of symptoms that all kind of cascade very quickly and also tend to resolve relatively quickly. Um, And often tend to be more like GI symptoms, um, muscle tension, headaches, maybe you clench your jaw, maybe you have trouble sleeping, irritability, that kind of thing. So it's less of that sympathetic kind of response. Um, I mean, sympathetic nervous system, not sympathetic like sympathy. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, And worry is the cognitive component of anxiety. So if, if anxiety is a feeling that's a state of readiness for potential danger up ahead, worry is the, what if there's a gunman who might come into my space? Right. Okay. And so those two things go yeah. hand in hand. No, I think that's a really good explanation as, as, and as someone that suffers with anxiety myself, what you said there about the sort of the state of readiness, you know, f- that something might happen. That's, that's how I feel a lot of the time in sort of a constant state of being on edge, you know, and I think a lot of people um, can, can relate to that, to that feeling, but obviously uh, Jill, a little bit of anxiety, um, a little bit of fear in, in, in our day-to-day lives is, is, is not a problem and, and can actually sometimes be useful. I think there is always sort of of only negative connotations attached to the word anxiety, which again sort of feeds the beast and stuff like that. Because if you think about, you know, an exam or a job interview or something like that, a little bit of anxiety is healthy because it, you know, it puts you on your toes, it makes you prepare, prepare better and all the rest of it. However, one thing I did want to ask you is sort of at what point would you say it 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 has become problematic in someone's life? At what point does it stop being healthy and it becomes something that perhaps might need, you know, sort of some help in treating? Yeah, it's a great question. And you're absolutely right. You know, if you imagine a graph, it's a parabola, like an upside down U. So, you know, we know that that moderate level of arousal is helpful, exactly as you said, 
but very high anxiety and also very low anxiety can both interfere with performance. Right. Yeah. Because if you just like don't have any worry at all about your job interview, you're not going to prepare. <laughs> and True. so yeah. you may actually do more poorly. So when is it at the point where it's problematic? I think the, the easiest answer to that is whenever it's interfering. So if it's getting in the way of you being able to live your life in the way that you want to, if it gets in the way of, say, relationships, work, school, your ability to study, um, if it's chronically getting in the way of your sleep, you know, it's normal to have a sleepless night here or there. But if it's like chronically getting in the way of your sleep and the sleep deprivation is is causing difficulties or you're having some significant health challenges, um, you know, that's when it's problematic. I think the question of when do we go to therapy or when do we get meds may be similar, but a little different. I think, you know, your anxiety doesn't have to, there are a lot of people who have, are very high functioning, even when they have anxiety, Yeah, yeah. right? Like I can still get up and I can go to work and it's not interfering in my relationships, at least as far as I can tell, but I just feel terrible, you know? And so like, any time that you feel like you're just struggling, it's okay to reach out for help. And in fact, you know, this isn't necessarily supported by research and data, but I'll give you my own anecdotal experience in seeing patients for over 20 years. When people come see me, when I have someone come to me and say, I had my first panic attack three weeks ago and I don't know what's going on, they tend to have really strong outcomes because they're getting ahead of it before there's time for um, problematic patterns to take root. Yes. Yeah. It's like a snowball almost, isn't it? Like rolling down a hill. If you imagine the longer you leave it, the more snow, the more baggage it picks up. Whereas if you stop it immediately, it's a lot easier to treat, I imagine. Exactly. I love that. That's such a great metaphor. Yeah. And, and I think people often Minim, not minimize, they invalidate their own experience. Like, oh, I'm fine. I shouldn't need therapy. It's not that bad. You know, and maybe you don't, but if there's any part of you that feels like you could use some help, you know, go for it. And it can, it can, you might need less of it if you get it sooner. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm also a big believer in that you actually, you don't need to sort of believe that you are suffering with any kind of mental illness to benefit from therapy. You know, we go exactly. to a physical gym to improve, you know, how, how we look and feel, you know, going to see a therapist is like the mental gym. And also, you know, you can be high functioning with anxiety, but it's still interfering with your life. You know, it's um, your ceiling could be here as opposed to, you know, a, a bit higher. So, so yeah, no, I think that was, um, that was very well explained. And Jill, the next thing I wanted to, to ask you about um, was sort of the, the what causes anxiety. And now I'm acutely aware that for every person and every case, this can be different. But you said there, you know, you've been practicing for over over 20 years. And I'm wondering if sort of over that time, you've seen any sort of common patterns, common things that that cause anxiety, whether that's, you know, the loss of a loved one when you're young or a particular traumatic event. Are, are there any sort of really common things that you sort of see time and time again as, as causes? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's different for every person, but what tends to be the same are kind of these um, cl clusters or let's call them vulnerabilities. So in fact, um, David Barlow, who was my mentor in graduate school, who's a, a, a well-known anxiety expert, he has what's called the triple vulnerability model. And so the real answer to your question is we don't really know, like there's no specific mathematical formula that says, oh, this, this, and this are the three things that cause anxiety. We don't really know. But what we have are models, theoretical models that have a lot of empirical support to say, we have a pretty good idea that this is pretty close to what is, what is you know, making this more likely. And so Barlow's triple vulnerability model, if you imagine a Venn diagram, so picture three circles that all intersect. So each of the two circles intersect and then all three intersect in the middle. Okay. One of these circles is your biological vulnerability. And so this is things like, do you have a family history? So do you have a genetic predisposition to developing anxiety or, or anything else? Um, one of the circles is your general vulnerability. So this is things like, did you grow up having lots of experiences with a lack of perceived control? Maybe you moved around a lot. Maybe you grew up with a, you know, a family who invalidated you frequently. And then the third circle is your specific vulnerability. So this might be something like you had a, an acute traumatic experience. You experimented with a specific drug. Now, if you have just one of these, 
you may not have any symptoms at all. If there are two that overlap, then you may have symptoms without it getting to the point of being problematic, interfering, et cetera. It's when all three of these overlap in that middle part that you're most vulnerable to having a diagnosable anxiety disorder. And so everybody's Venn diagram will look different based on their own individual learning histories. You know, they're, they're in their culture. I mean, all of those things that that have spots in those circles. Of course. Yeah. We can have each, we can each have our own experiences within each part of that, that Venn diagram. But, um, but yeah, really, a really good way of explaining that. I love how we we went from saying at the start, sort of, we don't know to having a really good answer there in terms of (laughs) of these are the three things that actually can cause it. But obviously, you know, and especially having been through therapy myself, I'm acutely aware that everything is so different and so complex uh, for each person. But, you know, there might be some people listening that, that relate to one part or many parts of that and, and that might be helpful. So, so yeah, thanks for that. And um, Jill, the next sort of part of the interview that I wanted to move on, move on to is kind of things that we can do in our lifestyles to sort of help keep feelings of anxiety at bay. And, and the first thing that I wanted to mention, because it's had a profoundly positive impact on my own anxiety and mental health in general, is exercise. And um, I've heard sort of doctors say before, like if, if exercise was something that we could bottle and, and you know, prescribe to patients, it would be the kind of miracle cure. And and certainly for my own anxiety, if I go through a period of not doing much sort of cardio or whatever, I I, I notice that I feel more anxious and I feel terrible again. And um, yeah, I, I guess my question is, why does exercise help if, if, if it does, or maybe perhaps my case is just, is, is unique. But so if it does help, why, why is that? And is it something that, that you recommend to, to people that you mm-hmm. see with, with anxiety? Um, yeah, so you, you are absolutely right. And in fact, there's at least one study, I'm sure there are many more, but there's at least one study that looked at exercise versus an antidepressant for depression. So it's not an anxiety study, but for depression and exercise actually performed better than the antidepressant. The wow. problem is it's very difficult to get depressed people to get up and exercise every day. Right. Um, but it, it really is a pretty profound finding and it, and it certainly suggests, and, you know, we see evidence everywhere that exercise is just good for you across the board. It lowers your, um, resting heart rate, your blood pressure. You know, I don't actually know what the mechanism is for the relationship between exercise and anxiety. Um, It's possible that one thing that I don't know what's happening physically and medically, um, but it's possible that one of the things that happens psychologically is we know that one of the biggest um, struggles for folks with anxiety and especially people who have a more panicky type of presentation, that kind of acute sympathetic nervous system response um, is often people who have anxiety become anxious about the anxiety itself. Right. Mm. And they work very hard to avoid anything that will trigger physiological sensations that are similar to anxiety. So maybe you give up caffeine because caffeine makes your heart beat faster. Lots of people actually give up exercise because exercise makes you sweaty and sort of short of breath and makes your heart beat fast. Um, and, And the antidote is kind of this paradoxical intervention, right? So let me actually start with a little metaphor and then I'll come back around to what I was just saying. If I, if I said to you, okay, Sam, I'm going to hook you up to this machine and it's kind of like a lie detector, but it's an anxiety detector machine. And as long as you don't get anxious, you're going to be totally fine. Okay. But if you get anxious and my machine registers your anxiety, it's going to deliver a lethal shock and you're going to (laughs) die, but just don't get anxious and you're going to be totally fine. Failed straight away. One second, I would fail that. No, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Of because course I, you would. And yeah, so would yeah. everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Like even people without anxiety mm. would fail that test. Yeah. Because if you think about what your relationship to anxiety has now become, it's, oh my God, anxiety is bad. It's dangerous. It's going to kill me. I have to not feel it. I have to get rid of this anxiety. And so now you're anxious about anxiety. So you're anxious. So as long as you are unwilling to have it, you are anxious about anxiety. So you're anxious. Even if you're not anxious about anything else, if you're anxious about anxiety, you're anxious. Yeah. And so, you know, you said you want to talk to me about how do we keep this anxiety at bay? And I'm thinking, oh, you're in for it because I'm going to give you an answer that you are not expecting, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah. 
the last thing I want to teach is anxiety is bad. So here are all the ways you need to learn how to keep it at bay because it's reinforcing this message that anxiety is bad and dangerous and we need to get rid of it. Now, anxiety is horribly uncomfortable and no one wants to feel it, but it also happens to be a very normal part of the human range of emotions. As you mentioned before, in some ways it's even beneficial. Um, But as long as we promote this message, it's bad, it's dangerous, we must get rid of it. You run the risk of being anxious about anxiety. So you're anxious. Yeah, which is not a state that anybody you see what wants. I'm saying? I do. Yeah, of course, a hundred percent. I guess so, right? so, so. Yeah. So just just to explain, sort of my so my own experience with sort of how exercise helps me, and I wonder if anybody listening can relate to this. But for anybody that has a sort of because I think overthinking and anxiety are sort of quite closely related. And um, for me, I find if I go on a half an hour run, for example, during that half an hour, I'm not thinking of anything else apart from one foot in front of the other, and so it gives me that headspace that I need. It's almost like a way of relaxing, you know, for someone who doesn't suffer with anxiety, it'd be going having a lie down or whatever. Whereas for me, it will be going and engage in some physical exercise that sort of pre- prevents the, the sort of cogs in the brain going around really fast. But I do also um, understand perfectly um, what you're saying there about the need to actually sort of let it be and not try and fight it off because obviously then that just um, sort of fuels the beast, if you like, and makes exactly. it and makes it greater. And that right. actually leads me quite nicely into my, into my next question because another thing that's sort of, you know, banded around when talking about anxiety and mental health in in general is sort of mindfulness, meditation and and these kind of techniques. And um and obviously this is something that I've tried and I've found meditation to be hugely beneficial. And obviously one of the sort of practices, one of the teachings is, you know, to notice these thoughts coming in, acknowledge them, not try and remove them and let them be, but just understand them, you know, for for what they are. They are thoughts rather than reality. And um, and yeah, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a bit about sort of if meditation and mindfulness can be helpful in terms of sort of treating people with anxiety and and yeah, just just a bit about that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, going quickly back to the exercise piece, I think that's exactly what you were describing. When you talk about your experience of exercise, <clears throat> what you're describing really is kind of being in the zone or a state of flow. Um And that's mindfulness, you know, that if the definition, there's many definitions of mindfulness, but John Kabat-Zinn's definition from his uh, 94 book is it's a particular way of paying attention on purpose to the present and non-judgmentally. So when you're running, you are paying attention in the present, not judgmentally. So you're not worrying about the future. You're not ruminating about the past. You're just in the moment, experiencing the moment. I think the other thing that's happening just to connect this to what I was saying about um, being anxious about anxiety and needing to practice willingness and make space is when you're running and your heart is beating fast and you're out of breath and um, you know, your, your muscles are are even sort of tense at that time because you're right. Your large muscle groups are activated when you're running. You're sort of mimicking many of the so-called symptoms or physiological sensations of fear or anxiety. So you're willing to have those experiences. So your relationship to those feelings is one of allowing acceptance, willingness versus scanning your body. We call it high body vigilance, noticing something and then saying, oh God, this is bad. It's it's dangerous. And then potentially kicking in kind of a fight flight response. So I think there's a willingness to have physiological sensations, a practice of mindfulness where you're present and not judgmental. Um, and preventing you from worrying about the future and ruminating about the past that, you know, taken together, it makes perfect sense why this would psychologically be something that benefits people who have anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. I'd never looked at it before as, as sort of mindfulness, but obviously that is essentially exactly what it is. It's just rather than lying down and meditating, it's just a different, a different thing. But in terms of sort of meditation specifically, I mean, yeah, is, is that something that you have tried yourself? Is it something that you recommend to, to patients? And, and if so, and someone's listening to this thinking, okay, that sounds good. And um, h- how would you recommend somebody get started in it? If it is something yeah. that you do recommend yourself? Yourself. Perhaps it's not, but so it it one hundred percent is. It absolutely is something I recommend. But I'm going to put a huge caveat on it, <laughs> which is it really depends on what it is in the service of. 
Okay. So if somebody is saying, oh my God, I'm so anxious and it's intolerable and I can't handle it. So maybe I'll just go try meditation. And if maybe if I just do this meditation app, then I won't be anxious anymore. You're still anxious about anxiety. So you're anxious. So what's going to happen is you're going to do your meditation app and that's going to be a really lovely, blissful 10 minutes or not. Sometimes meditation is really hard and makes you more aware of your thoughts and feelings, right? But with practice, it usually gets easier and maybe you'll have a blissful 10 minutes, but you're still anxious about anxiety. So you're still going to be anxious. It's going to give you little blips of feeling good, but isn't necessarily going to have the, you know, full psychological impact a person might be having, that might be hoping to have. So I think the appropriate way to think about mindfulness. So meditation is one specific type of mindfulness. Mindfulness is more of like a way of being, right? I'm going to be focused on the present non-judgmentally. You know, we can't really help it that judgments show up. So when a judgment arises, I'm going to let it go rather than getting hooked by it. Same with any other thought, but be present. And we can do anything mindfully. So anytime you're using your senses, you know, what do you see and really focus on what you're seeing? What do you smell? What do you hear? You're being mindful. And so you don't necessarily have to sit on a cushion with your eyes closed for 45 minutes <laughs> no, no. to be practicing mindfulness, right? That's a specific type. If you're meditating, it's great. No problem, you know, doing that. But again, be aware of what your rationale is. But I think the overarching, you know, when I recommend mindfulness to my clients, the reason for it is I want you to get really good at choosing where you're putting your attention you know, that you have a flexible attention that is, yes, it's on the present, but like right now I'm focusing on you. But if I suddenly heard my kids aren't home, but if my kids started screaming in the next room and I thought there was an emergency, I could quickly turn my attention there and I'm choosing what to attend to. Um, and what happens when you get better at mindfulness is you create more space between the time a trigger happens and the try at the time a response needs to be decided. So when we're not mindful, we tend to be reactive and we tend to be on autopilot. Right? So for example, where I struggle the most is when my kids are fighting with each other. It is like nails on a chalkboard to me. <laughs> and so they fight and I instantly snap at them. There's no space between that trigger and response. If I'm mindful, if I go, "Whoa, I'm really noticing that there is attention in my body, butterflies in my stomach, irritability, whatever it is that shows up. And I take a breath and I say, okay, how do I want to choose to respond when it comes to me being a good mom, which matters to me in this moment? And can I choose to act patiently, even though I'm not feeling patient? So when I'm using mindfulness in therapy or encouraging people to practice mindfulness outside, it is in no way ever about trying to control anxiety. Because if I'm saying, go do a meditation app to relax, then I'm saying you should be anxious about anxiety because anxiety is bad and dangerous. So instead, it's I want you to get really good at being present and aware so that when stuff happens, you can choose how you're going to respond in a values consistent way instead of constantly reacting on autopilot. Yeah, that's a really good explanation of sort of what um yeah, what mindfulness practice tries tries to get you to to do, you know, and it goes back to what we were saying before about it sort of actually being really unhealthy to try and get rid of these feelings, to try and push them away or keep them at bay. It's actually more about noticing them, seeing that they're there and as you say, choosing how you respond to them and note and and noticing that they are just thoughts rather than realities and um and so yeah, that's something that I found very helpful um in my own mindfulness uh, practices and and yeah I think you explained that you explained that very well but Jill another thing that I wanted to ask you about which I'm sure listeners are, are quite eager to hear about is when someone is in this moment of really heightened anxiety or perhaps at the start of a panic attack for example it happened to me the other day I was flying back from from Spain and all of a sudden I just had this really weird sensation which was sort of the start of a panic attack of kind of just having this weird realization that I was this high up in the air and all of a sudden that suddenly really made me feel really anxious and I could feel sort of my heart rate going and I, and I thought I was going to have a panic attack but I managed to just sort of 
just sort of keep it down by, by breathing, trying to rationalize with myself. And, and so I averted it on that occasion, but there's also been times where I haven't been able to. So in that moment for me, what helps was, you know, sort of deep breathing and trying to, trying to rationalize, but yeah, are there any tips, tricks, practices, bits of advice that, that you give to patients, um, to help with these kind of sort of crisis moments when the anxiety is, is, is getting too much. I mean, the way I describe it, when I'm having one of those moments, it's like, it's like I can feel, I feel anxiety from the bottom of my toe to the top of my head. You know, it feels like it's engulfed your whole body and, and you, you get that sort of loss of control. So, so yeah, when you are feeling like that, is it breathing? Is it distraction techniques or, or maybe is it none of that? Or maybe is it just let it happen? I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a couple ways to look at this. So one is like, you know, if you were my client and this had happened, I would be recommending that you do the the opposite of what you think you should be doing, which is if you're starting to feel panicky, right? And you feel that coming from your toes to the top of your feet and you think, okay, my my instinct is I should slow down and breathe and do whatever I can to keep this at bay. And you did and it worked. So you'll probably keep trying that. And and I'll I'll get back to this in a second. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Actually, I'm going to go with that right now. If you have strategies that help you soothe your nervous system, you know, sometimes, you know, some people call it the amygdala hijack, right? Like when you are just flooded with really high intense emotions, it's like it takes over everything and you couldn't think rationally if you tried, right? No matter how high the incentive is, it's like too late. It's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have ways that you can soothe your nervous system so that you can like get that frontal lobe back on track so that you can clear headedly make good decisions, there's nothing wrong with that. Unless whatever it is that you're doing to self-soothe has some cost. So let me give you an example. So what we're talking about here essentially is experiential avoidance. So avoidance is really anything that you do or don't do to try to control how you feel. So if that's the definition, if I have a headache and I take a couple Advil, ibuprofen, technically I'm changing the way I feel. So it's avoidance. Is that bad? Well, it depends. Does it have a cost? If I take a couple ibuprofen every once in a while to get rid of a headache and there's no known, you know, health problems associated with that. And I can afford it financially. And it's allowed me to show up here and really be present with you because I'm not preoccupied by head pain. And this interview is important to me, then we're good to go. Right. But if I'm like, so unwilling to feel any kind of pain, and when you're a middle-aged woman, something always hurts. (laughs) That I'm taking like four Advil every two hours so that I'm now having rebound headaches and getting an ulcer. Well, then there's a cost. Now it has a cost, Mm -hmm. right? And that's a pretty extreme example. Most people aren't taking four Advil every two hours. Yeah. (laughs) Now, you doing breathing exercises that successfully staved off a panic attack on an airplane, that doesn't sound like it has any cost to me, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The exception being... If you're consistently saying to yourself, oh my God, this is bad. It's dangerous. I can't have it. I desperately need to do anything well, to make it go and, away. And this is one thing that I, ju- I ju- just before you roll on with this, I will say, although it did just about allow me to hold on in the moment and stop me having a panic attack, it was also kind of creating more panic in a way, the sort of feeling that I had to stop. It's almost like I could feel it rising through my body and me trying to suppress it kind of started this b- internal battle, which, you know, it might not have actually helped. It might have made it worse, right? But I just, um, but but yeah, so although on this occasion it didn't result in a full-blown panic attack, yeah, I, I see where you're going with this. And, and yeah, I just wanted to add that there definitely were some negative aspects of it. So yeah, sorry to interrupt that's there, right. but I felt that was important to add. Yeah. No, yeah. because that's a great insight and you're absolutely right. And and what might also be the case is you're now telling yourself, well, yeah, I didn't have a panic attack and it was okay, but that's only because I did my breathing and I did this and I did that. And if I hadn't done those things, then I would have had a full-blown panic attack and it would have been terrible and I never would have been able to handle it. So it's still kind of maintaining this, this relationship to anxiety that it's bad and it's dangerous. You know, and trying to convince yourself of the opposite, like, I love anxiety. It's great. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. It's more like, okay, this is uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. It's temporary and I can handle it. And how do we know that's true? Because you've done it before. It's been true every other time. Yeah. yeah. So the other way to, 
to handle this that's like the opposite of what we're talking about is to have an absolute like bring it on mentality. So for example, let's say you're getting dizzy. If you really had a a willing and accepting attitude toward your physiological symptoms, that would look like, oh, you think you you're talking to your anxiety right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you think you know dizzy? I'll show you dizzy and you stand up and spin around in circles. Yeah. <laughs> now that might be difficult on an airplane. Yeah. And we don't want the air marshal to be like, uh what is sir, going on? What's happening here? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But this is what I would say. Like, you know, if you're like, oh, my heart has started beating fast. Oh, you think you know rapid heart rate? I'll show you rapid heart rate and you get up and you do jumping jacks or you run in place really fast because what happens is you're saying, I've got this. I can handle all these physiological symptoms. I don't have to do anything to control or suppress them. And magically what typically happens is they don't tend to um, increase that. You're sort of putting the lid on your fight flight because think about it. Think back to this experience. You start having symptoms and your mind goes into a big where, oh my God, I'm going to have a panic attack. This is going to be terrible. So it's almost like you can cognitively trigger a fight flight response because of your, what we call a catastrophic misinterpretation. But basically when you have, you know, scary thoughts about your symptoms, it can trigger a fight flight response. So one of the ways to not create that is to say like, bring it on. Yeah. Do you know Bring what? it on. As soon as you said that um, about sort of taking that approach to it, saying, bring it on, like I can handle this, you know, um, I, I, it, it instantly felt empowering when you were saying that. And I can imagine that that would actually really work. And then, and then it also, it takes the fear away in some, in some senses, because you're not then sort of worried about, oh, this is going to happen. Am I going to have a panic attack? You're saying, you know, I can deal with this. Let's, and so that takes away that worry and it stops. Yeah. Now I can see this, there's, there's perfect yeah. sense in that. And it seems really backward probably to some people listening to this that have probably not, not experienced it, but sometimes, you know, the, the things that sound the most crazy are actually the best the best solutions and so i've actually got a very long i've got a long haul flight to to costa rica on tuesday of like 12 hours so perhaps um perhaps i'll try some of that i don't know whether i'll be spinning around in the in the aisle i might be told to sit down by the air hostesses but definitely i'll try this um a technique of yeah of of willing it on and saying you know what this is actually okay these feelings are nothing more than that they are just feelings even if i do have a panic attack i've had them before i'll get through them that kind of that kind of narrative rather than the the approach that I took before, which is, yeah, trying to, mm-hmm. trying to, uh, suppress, which can kind of compound it. So yeah, that was really right. useful. Thanks for that, Jill. And, um, and, and I yeah. want to add just to that little mantra is like, mm. is acknowledging it's uncomfortable. Like I don't want people to invalidate their experience, right. Yeah, but yeah. to be able to say this is uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous because that's where that fear comes from is really feeling like these symptoms are somehow dangerous. And if you can say like, this sucks, it's uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. It's temporary. I can handle it. You know, that can go a long way. And, and part of the way to believe that it's not dangerous, because you might say that and really be like, but no, my body is in fight flight mode, which is my body's way of saying I'm in danger. It's basically responding to a false alarm, but every single symptom of a panic attack exists to help you survive. So for example, um, you know, you hyperventilate to oxygenate your blood, the blood rushes to the large muscle groups so that you can fight or flee. You know, we could go through every single symptom of the panic attack and they are specifically designed to help you fight or flee in the face of danger so that you survive. Wow. So whatever the big feared outcome is, I'm going to have a heart attack. Is that something that would help you survive in the face of danger? No. So it's not going to happen. We were evolutionarily programmed this way. Yeah. That's a really, a really powerful way of explaining it. Actually, I never thought of it like that because anyone that's had a panic attack or or on the verge of having one knows that it it literally does feel like you're going to die. Your your body, your mind, it feels like it's telling you you're going to die. But actually, that's so interesting to hear you say it's actually sort of saying the opposite. It's saying I'm hyper ready to stay alive, actually, which is which is a really powerful way to view it. So, yeah, lots of helpful things here. I'll have to let you know how the flight goes, but I think I think it's going to go okay. But Jill, another thing I wanted to ask you about because 
I think it can be really difficult um, for family, friends, partners uh, of people that, that sometimes suffer with panic attacks, anxiety, to sort of to know how to approach someone when they're in one of those moments. You know, for example, if, um, you know, my brother or a friend or whatever is sat next to me in a plane seat and I start sort of having a panic attack or whatever, um, you know, I think it can be really difficult for them to know what to do, how to approach someone. Is there kind of any recommendations of how somebody should how somebody should act in that situation or, or not? Because I guess also, you know, again, it's incredibly individual, isn't it? Some people might like reassurance. So for example, I think that's what would work for me. Somebody just kind of acknowledging how I'm feeling, but telling me it's going to be all right or whatever. But then other people I'm sure probably want space and nobody to say anything to them. So yeah, is it just totally individual or, or are there some sort of common practice practices, things that people can, can know that might, might help Sure. I mean, I think you can always ask if this is something that's kind of predictable that tends to happen on flights. You know, you can always that the family member can always ask if this happens, what do you think you most need for me? And I wouldn't ask when the person's in the middle of a panic attack no. because they can't really respond <laughs> yeah. very well at that time, but to ask in advance. But that said, what typically happens is friends and family members with all the best intentions engage in what we call accommodation, which is, you know, I guess the lay person term would be enabling. So reassurance seeking is a, or re, giving reassurance is a great example. You're going to be fine. This, um, that, you know, maybe kind of works in the short term, but doesn't really solve anything in the long term and also reinforces that belief like, oh, well, I survived, but that's only because I had my brother there reassuring me. If he hadn't been there, then it would have been a total disaster. Right. Right. Mm. Um, and, and it's just a different kind of avoidance, you know, people who maybe have, let's say like contamination OCD or germ fears, you know, that parents or or loved ones might say, yes, just go take another shower. We'll wait for you. It's fine. And it's intended to help make their loved one feel better because it's so hard to see the people we care about in pain. But those things are actually maintaining the cycle and maintaining the problem. So if the person who's struggling can actually give the loved one permission to not do that, and to find a way to like challenge them in a gentle way. So for example, maybe instead of don't worry, Sam, you're going to be fine. Um, they could say something like, I'm here. You've got this, you know, keep going. So it's like encouragement without reassurance. Yeah, that's and there's a really Does fine that line. Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. And it goes back to what we were saying before about, you know, sort of me saying to myself or anybody saying to themselves, you know, bring it on, I can do it. And so just having that sort of, it's almost like the support from the crowd in a, in a, in a, in a sports match, right? But it's not actually concretely helping, but it's just a little bit of a, yeah, no, that does, that does make perfect sense. And um, yeah, you know, I'd never thought about it like that before because, yeah, if you always rely on the sort of uh, reassurance of other people, you're then going to feel you need that when in reality, maybe you don't. So yeah, family members, yes. friends, partners can still play a role, but sort of, yeah, supporting you in your own fight rather than trying to win it for you, I guess, is, is kind of what you're That's what you're right. That's, that's very well said. And, and the other thing that can happen is that chronic reassurance seeking can ultimately erode relationships because people kind of get tired of having to continuously provide reassurance when it doesn't really work. Like it sort of kind of works a little bit in the short term, but it's not actually fixing the person's problem. So it can start to feel frustrating when, when the, the helper is not, is, is it ineffective basically? Um, and, and it can actually get in the way of, of relationships over time. No, this, this makes perfect sense. And it's, uh, yeah, it's been a learning curve for me, some of this. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing all of that, Jill. And, um, one final thing that I wanted to touch on was, you know, we've mentioned quite a lot of things in this podcast, but obviously none of this is ever a substitute for, um, getting professional help and seeing, uh, you know, an experienced psychologist such as yourself, but obviously, um, people can have sort of a bit of fear in terms of taking that step in terms you know, uh, in terms of reaching out to a therapist, I know it took me years to to do it. And so I wondered if you could give listeners an overview of what what does therapy in, involve? If somebody was to, for example, contact you for 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 sessions, yeah, how, how would that look for them? And how would you go about treating anxiety in a sort of uh, therapy setting? Mm -hmm, that's a great question. Well, I think, first of all, all therapists are different. People have different theoretical orientations and just sort of different styles. 
things. But in general, you're going to start by seeing somebody who wants to get to know you first. So maybe they do an intake interview, an assessment to try to get to the bottom of like, what's going on? Where are you stuck? What do you need help with? Maybe they'll specifically try to determine if you have a diagnosis. Maybe they won't. It depends. Um, from there, it's coming up with a treatment plan. What is it that I can do that I think will best help you to become unstuck? That's where treatment then starts to look different depending on theoretical orientation. The type of therapy I do in my clinic and that we is evidence-based, so has a lot of empirical support for its efficacy for anxiety disorders, um, is cognitive behavioral therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. And a critical component of both of those is exposure exposure techniques or exposure therapy. And really this is all about facing your fear and practicing that willingness toward those um, difficult, uncomfortable internal experiences. Um, so typically ACT and CBT are like relatively short term, you know, four to six months ish is enough time to learn what you need to learn, practice, see some progress. And then even if you're not where you want to be, you're kind of at a place where if you wanted to go out on your own, you'd certainly be ready and prepared to do that. But people spend all different lengths of time in therapy. And sometimes they have different things they want to work on at different times. I've had many clients who have um, finished therapy and done really well and three years go by and some big stressor has happened and they want to come back for a handful of sessions. Um, you know, so duration, it, it looks different with different therapists, but that's kind of a basic snapshot of what it will often entail. Yeah. yeah. And it can be, it can be extremely uh, helpful, you know, speaking from past, uh, from personal experience. And, you know, it took me probably like seven years from first feeling anxiety to going to see a therapist about it. And going back to that sort of snowball uh, analogy metaphor that we spoke about earlier, if I'd done it a lot earlier, it would have been a lot easier to sort out. So, so yeah, for anyone listening that hasn't made that step, there's certainly nothing wrong with it. You know, there should be no stigma surrounding it. Just see it as the mental gym, you know? Um, so yeah. I love been, that. And, yeah. I, and I think a lot of people are so scared, like what they imagine, they imagine therapy is going to be like so hard and emotional and challenging. And it's certainly can be, but it's almost always less so than your anxious brain is telling you it's going to be. And in addition to that, it's also empowering and liberating. And you feel really proud and good about yourself because you're doing stuff that scares you and you're changing your life for the better. So it's, you know, most people who had a hard time starting therapy, you know, always are saying like, oh my God, I'm so glad I did that. I wish I hadn't waited so long. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's ex exactly what yeah. I said. It felt like sort of lifting, uh, you know, as if I was carrying a huge, heavy, you know, backpack and you start to remove, you know, bricks from, from that bag throughout the therapeutic process. So, so yeah, something that I definitely recommend. Um, Jill, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. I feel like I've learned a lot through the podcast. I'm sure listeners have as well, but just before we finish off, I was wondering, is there anything that I haven't asked that you wanted to, to, to leave us on that you wanted to say, or per perhaps we've covered everything, maybe not, but yeah, if there was anything else you wanted to add fire away. And, uh, if not, we can, uh, we can wrap it up there. Well, I think the one thing that just kind of immediately pops into my head, maybe for people who are a little bit, um, apprehensive about starting therapy, there are other places you can start to still practice, changing, you know, changing some bad habits, right. That are maintaining anxiety. There are so many books out there that are based on empirically supported therapies, you know, workbooks and self-help books based on CBT and acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, there are podcasts, right. Podcasts are free books are 10 to 15 bucks, you know, so you can make this very small investment to start learning, start practicing, um, you know, and, it, it may be the case that that's enough and you're good to go on your own. But if even, you know, in practicing those, you're still finding like, Ugh, I'm not quite where I want to be, then um, you'll already have some exposure to this stuff so that then maybe starting therapy won't be quite so difficult, but there's so many resources out there. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a really good point to make because, you know, it can feel like a big leap sort of going straight to therapy for some people. And yeah, you know, you can dip, dip your feet in the water with the resources that you can find out there. And then, you know, perhaps you, you want extra support with those and, and that might be when you, when you find a therapist, but, um, but yeah, Jill, it's been, um, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking uh, some time out of your, your busy schedule. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate it. So thank you very much for coming on. You're so on. welcome. Yeah. 
It's my pleasure. I love to nerd out about anxiety and psychology. So thanks for having me. Yeah, no, no problem at all. <clears throat> That's it for today's episode. I hope you liked it or found it useful. If you did, make sure you hit subscribe. It really helps the channel out. And also that way, it makes sure that you never miss an episode. If you've got a story you want to share on the Back on Track podcast, get in touch. Give me a shout. I'd love to hear from you via backontrackpod at gmail.com.